Hello, Fearless Gamers, and welcome to another podcast here on Fearless Games. I'm Matt the Vet, and today I am joined by... Matt the Clown. No one wants and to go that's next. It. No. <laughs> <laughs> that, and that's it. Nobody else is joining. We're all just listening. Uh, no James the Walker. We don't even uh, care. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't even remember my name anymore. <laughs> you are the uh, butt lord. <laughs> uh, that's so. Okay. Yep. So, so welcome. Welcome. That's terrible. Uh, your potty humor is not amusing. Sure. I'm sure it's more amusing than, than that trash smack talk you were talking on the last episode of Touching Base. Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, has anyone commented on that yet and made fun of me for being, like, a loser? Wait, no. what smack talk did you talk? Yeah, about um, colleges. I think I called you fat also. I am fat. That's well, not yeah. smack talk, that's realism. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think he made a comment about community colleges or something. I did bash community did, college a little bit. Well, uh, I, yeah, that's because really they deserve to be slightly bashed. Oof. I mean, I do, I, I, I do love the show Community. Um, <laughs> I've I don't only, know what I got. <laughs> oh, I'm getting us in trouble. I don't care. <laughs> I've only watched one episode of Community and it's the D&D episode and it was hilariously awesome. You just should go on Hulu and watch whatever is randomly for free because everything involved in Community is wonderful. It, I so. heard that the, the cast can't stand Chevy Chase. I believe it, but at the same oh, time who cares? <laughs> oh, so uh, you know what? I'm going to bring this up now uh, okay. Because uh, it's fresh on my mind, and it can't wait for the next Touching Base episode. But okay. <clears throat> apparently, there are some very butthurt Grey Knight fans out there. Because from what I've read, now I don't have exact quotes because it's not right in front of me. But apparently in the recent Chaos Codex, there was some fluff that heavily implies that their special character, Drago... Uh, fought his way all the way through the warp, uh, got in front of Slanesh, you know, to try and kill him, only to end up corrupted by Slanesh himself. Huh. Uh, huh. Well, which I, I happen to think was... is super cool. <laughs> well, it's dumb because the whole Grey Knight fluff has been ingrained in Grey Knight fluff since their, in, you know, since their inception is that they are the only uncorruptible force in the galaxy. And it's, turn, it's basically saying, my cool thing is better, it's cool than your cool thing, and therefore it'll trump it. Kind of like saying, See? you know, fire beats water, but water will be fire, and then fire will be water again. And the whole but, idea is that you can't have, if you're going to make your, your power of the galaxy uncorruptible and not have them be, because they are space marines, but they're uncorruptible space marines. You have the chaos space marines to be the knights that fell. It's supposed to be your shiny beacon. It's really it. I can see it being lame to have the uncorruptible suddenly get corrupted. I think it's dumb that they're that the idea of them being uncorruptible is useful against something as powerful as an actual chaos god. Like it's not think, that he, it's well, not well, that he just got dunked back. by some. It's not like he just got dunked by some demon. He made it to a chaos god, and that's what I, did it. Still, it's it's not. It's, he can still be uncorruptible. Let's, let's take a step back. And let's talk about the fact that he's living in the warp. Right, like he made he's it all dead. the way through that. No, and no. Then I mean, he should just be dead. He should well, just be dead. Well, yeah, that's that's another thing. I that's wasn't going to touch that, on that because that's, 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 that's well, whatever. Well, argumentatively, um, but um, there have been some stories out there. Granted, they weren't humans, but it has kind of been indicated that you can survive in the warp. Well, not even that. It's not that he can. It's that he is a Grey Knight, right? The Grey Knight basically yeah. going to chat the master, okay? They're psychers. He's living in the warp as a Grey Knight psyker who combats chaos and expels demons back to the warp. He's living in the jail cell that he put all the demons back into. How is he just not this shiny beacon of just, okay, all the sharks come and attack me? You know? <laughs> like, at well, once. From, um, from what I... from And again, I'm, I'm only paraphrasing because, uh, you know, it's all I got right for, now. But for anyone who is listening and wishes to correct any m misinformation that we have, feel free. Yeah, I'm only paraphrasing, but that was essentially what was going on. Like he was, you know, he was fighting everything that was coming for him because everything was coming for him. Uh, right, but, but 
at the same time manage to get through it because he's, I don't know, he's a Mary Sue and he can do that stuff. <laughs> like every other space marine. <laughs> right, right. Um, and I get that, like, the Grey Knights being uncorruptible is their thing, but Slanish's whole thing has been, like, that he can corrupt you be around, you, just being in the room with him corrupts you, like, since the very beginning. So it's really which one trumps which. Uh, I, see, yeah. I still think you can have your uncorruptible dude and still and just have Slanish wipe the floor. You know, because you, you, you have, I mean, you have things standing up to chaos all the time. You have Slanish held bent on the Eldar, but Eldar aren't falling in droves to him either. So, right. I figure... So I, just, I, I just hate the fact that Drago exists in the warp and that happened in the Grey Knights Codex. I've always hated that. He's a cool character, but then when he went into warp, it could have been, okay, he's dead. <laughs> um, I, I, I agree with that there. part, but I feel like if you're gonna throw someone into the warp and then end up having the fluff where he just gets his butt touched by, a, you know, like one of the chaos gods and dies, just throw him up against Corn. I don't <laughs> like the actual chaos fighty god. Cha- yeah. chaos god. You know, like Slanesh isn't really about the the punchy punchy. Slanesh is the second most fighty of the four. Is he really? Yeah. yeah. Yes, he I is. Just, but yeah. he does it conniving. I, I feel like well, more, Slanish. Oh, is, that's crazy. Well, Slanish is very um, like in a lot of the um fluff that I've read, like with the Eldar and um in Fear to Tread, they kind of always describe like the demonettes and the greater demons of Slanish as very Harlequiny, as in when they move, they're kind of like in it in the description when they were one of the serfs was describing the Space Marines fighting the greater demon of Slanish. He never said, you know, he ducked and weave and bob. He always said he kept dancing across the yeah. field. It's basically, uh, think of this way. Corn is, if you're going in D&D terms, is your classic barbarian fighter, whatever. Smashy, smashy. Uh, Slanesh is your dex fighter. You know, he's your fencer. He's all about being elegant and movement and, well, he, she. Mm. Sorry if I keep calling it a he. Well, so he, 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 he is the king, queen of the prince, princess of the Lord ladies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Eldar constantly <coughs> called it she who thirsts, but apparently his title is the Prince of Pleasure. So you cannot say he or she. If well, anybody really argues about it, they're just splitting hairs. It's both. And if you want to get real technical, a lot of his bigger demons go, "I am the Prince, Princess, or the Lord Lady, or the King, Queen of Pleasure." So yep, it's yeah, both, it works. Really. Which is kind of funny, uh, but Lord also kind of creepy. Uh, also, of uh, really quick, uh, the thing we're arguing about is um, I'm reading this off of Daka Daka uh, is on page 1617 of the Chaos Demon Codex. I don't think any of us have it. Uh, it no, just calls yet. it a no. wandering Adeptus Astartes who was, will is strong as silvered adamantium. So it doesn't have to be Drago. It probably yeah, but what, but are, what other space marine is rolling around in the warp? Well, Rust. think about it. How many space marines get lost in the warp? They get, everybody gets lost in the warp all the time. All the cool kids are doing it. So, I mean, why not have some random... You can have some yeah, random I, dude. I mean, technically, it, it uh, what's his name? Dude. Lysander was lost in the warp for yeah. a while. It, it could be uh, Lehman Russ. It could be a prime. For all we it know. doesn't say it isn't. Uh, you know what? Let's just say it is, because that means Lehman Russ got corrupted. <laughs> I'm good with that, too. We all hate Russ. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, yeah, wait, let's, wait, you know what? Let's wait, let's wait, let's wait, wait, wait for what you. Mean he, what do you mean he got corrupted? He's always nice. Corrupted. Nice. Well, he got his butt touched by Slanesh and he liked it. Um, no, when the Le- you know what? Now when the Lehman Russ uh, model comes out, I will buy it and I will convert it. Make- I'm going to convert it into a, a either a Herald of Slanesh or Keeper of Secrets. I, I think there's a song in here somewhere. I think it's uh, there, there's a, a Kiss the Girl and I Liked It song in here with Russ and a demon. Mm, yeah, you're stretching. No, you're stretching. No, I'm not. You're pulling. I, 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 I could see it. I could see it. It's terrible. I could see it. I, I, think it, I think if we're going to go the Katy Perry route, I think it, one of the boys you know, it, works better. No, no, no. It, it, I don't want to be one of the boys. Come on. <laughs> Come on. It's funny. I, I that had a and I liked it. I hope my star days don't mind it. <laughs> I hope you choke. Um, I also read about something really cool that I didn't know about. There was apparently a, a an orc war boss or warlord in this case, I suppose, who fought his way into the warp, ended up on some demon planet, and impressed Corn so much that he just sort of turned it turned his like turned it into a Valhalla kind of situation, <laughs> where like yeah, this whole there's... this whole war force just keeps getting up at the end of the day to fight more demons. 
when it comes yes. down to it, orcs I've read are about always that. wonderful. He 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 was he just literally fought his way into orc heaven. Well, yeah. Okay. yeah well, what what greater glory than just wake up, kill a bunch of demons, or kill a bunch of stuff, anything, and then then wake up and do it again for an orc. <laughs> um, now here's something interesting. Um, there's this new thing on Bell of Lost Souls talking about an issue with the Chaos Demon Codex already. Oh. And he points out two issues. Issue number one, Burning Chariot of Zanich. Um, it's an exalted flamer character, is a raider on a chariot. The vehicle he's riding is a chariot, open top, fast skimmer. Both the exalted flamer weapons are heavy. He is also a lone shooter. His chariot doesn't actually shoot. He is not relentless. So he can't shoot if he moves. Well, he can shoot the blue flame, but it's a snap fire. He can't shoot his pink fire at all. So what's the point of having this unit at all? He can't do crap even after a DS. It's not... I don't see a real issue there. It's, it's the issue of do you want to shoot or do you want to be maneuverable as a chariot? You move or you shoot. You don't have to do both just because you're, you're a magical, mystical thing. Yeah, we're if just used to everyone... Go. Yeah, sorry, we're just used to everyone being able to do both, and uh, it's nice to have units to make you choose. Maybe it right. is an error on their part, because let's be serious, they always have errors. I mean, and not just them. Let's, let's, let's take a step back. Any <laughs> Every game company book, does that. Any gaming-related book I have, whether it's an RPG or a war game, it's, it's full, I don't know who the editor is, but I want that job. I really want that job. We can all, no. yeah, it's such an easy job, because clearly they don't do it right anyway. Speaking, no. speaking from an editorial perspective... Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it that a lot of people don't realize, and it's mm. it's actually fairly easy for potentially major things to slip through the cracks if yeah. you don't have your A game at all times. And we have to remember these people to are have human. The person have the A game though. You can have say a, again. You can have you can have you can have it go through a series of checks. That's not how publishing works. You can have, but no, that's how making rules for the game works. Well, yeah, as far as as far as game rules go, yes. But I'm 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 saying talking just purely from an editorial perspective, you don't you never have a team of editors. You have one editor, so it's either on the <clears throat> it's either the you know the editor uh, made a mistake and missed something, which is possible, or the guys you know who submitted you know their you know whatever it was they they submitted to the editor left something out maybe or were it would you know they phrased it weird and the editor misinterpreted it. Like, there's a lot of things that could have happened I still want to another be in the editor's job because <laughs> it's only in those gaming books that I see it the other thing that I just want to point out that I just find interesting that um, Matt you brought up is how everyone is going nuts over this um, fluff thing with um, the space marine and essentially assuming it's Drago this is probably the first time I've heard a public bash of Phil Kelly and his book. See, this is, you know what this is? This is becoming expected. The, 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 the those, the, the hardcore gamers of any industry, in this case, these workshop people with, with 40k go disease, they, they, they're becoming like, they're putting things on pedestals and putting things to a certain regard, whether it's a person's ability to write or a person just as a bookmaker for whatever it is, like Phil Kelly in this instance, or whatever you want to do. And if they're not getting exactly what they think in their mind they would do, they bash it. Yep. Well, yeah, that's that's gamers. It, yeah, but if if you, you don't see it, it's getting worse and worse. As I'm saying, you didn't see it at this yes. level five years ago. Yes, I can agree with that. That the the um the preferences on writers and such on codexes, I feel, has gotten a lot more extreme. Like yeah, five years ago. People just people just went, oh my god, nobody's going to play any other book but this book. It was a typical, oh my god, overpowered, but then it really wasn't because it just jumped the gun. Yeah. And now it's a lot more like the preferences of certain writers versus other writers oh. and writing certain books. It's gotten to an extreme level. Yeah, actually, I think it's like um, just a little better way of putting it. It used to be, OMG, this book is coming out, and now it's, OMG, this guy is writing this book. Yeah. Has anyone read anything about the Church of Kelly and their response to this book yet? Because I haven't. Oh, no, just, I Did have... you just say the Church of Kelly? Yes. Are you not aware of the Church of Kelly? Again, I hope you choke. But it's I, a real thing. It's a real thing. No. I didn't come up with it. No, it's not. It's a real thing. No, There's it's a, one of Star Lord's to... stupid ideas. I need that to no, be no, one no. of his stupid ideas to stay <laughs> on this planet. 
No, <laughs> no. I, I, unfortunately, it is not. <laughs> um, um, Stark Lord or um, Wild Card, please inform the lovely listeners if they do, are not aware of what the Church <laughs> please, of Kelly is. Please, please don't be, spare I'll, them. Uh, I'll have no, Stark Lord to do it. Uh, the, the basic gist of it is there was a lot of uh, Matt Ward hate out there, people complaining about them, and someone looked for something good and realized Bill Kelly made a good book, and they made another good book, and they made another good book, and realized all of his books were good. So they started talking about his good books. I mean, what else can you say about that? Uh, they're fun guys. Uh, they, they, I forget which uh, blog is big on it, but a couple of the big blogs are involved in it. And uh, when they go to cons, they usually dress kind of in the really cheesy classic Mormon way. Not to insult Mormons, but like, you know, dress pants, the white shirt, and they bring like, talk about the good Pamphlets. book. Pamphlets. Yeah. The good book. And Kelly. they go, Have you, are you aware of the Church of Kelly? Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, it's funny. Um, a couple of the other big tournaments, when there was like a three-person team tournament, they just played all Kelly Codexes versus everyone else, and usually did pretty well. It's it's a fun joke movement, you know, just saying, let's appreciate yeah. a guy. Because, I mean, Coco usually writes decent stuff, and instead of always hating on dudes, let's talk about good Oh, excuse me. That's wow. The, uh, wow. Forward. That's the first edit. That was, that was the first yeah, edit. I don't think, uh, I don't think any of us have messed up that badly just yet. <laughs> not 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 on this even podcast. Even me. Even I've, me. And I'm the worst podcast. of us. I've, I've, I've had are. to censor other podcasts wow. before. But now, now, um, what does that look like? Though, like hours, it's, 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 it's good fun, you know, Jersey Kelly, funny concept. But, just like any funny concept, you have a group of gamers, a group of any enthusiasts who take it to the elitist next level. And, and this is actually how they want to bring up on, on this podcast. Completely different. Kind of changing the scope for a little bit. Uh, with, you know, we, we like our animes, right? Yes. The, you had the same exact thing here with, with that. If it's not, you know, it's got to be either this duck company or it's got to be this subtitle. If it's not subtitle, it's not pure anime and I can't watch it. Excuse me, it's anime. Um, you know, it's, it's the same concept, only brought in a different light here in Wargaming. Same thing with the anime. Yeah. It gets that way with a lot of different nerd hobbies. Mediums. Uh, it yeah. does, and it's because the thing that drives nerds, lots of bottom. A lot of nerds, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm about to make a blanket statement that I'm comfortable making. A lot of nerds are bitter, lonely people. <laughs> and feel the need to, like, get elitist in order to feel better about themselves, because at least I'm better than those nerds. Uh, I, I don't think it's um, quite that. I feel, um... Uh, we're gonna, I guess, overanalyze this because it, it goes into other things. But a lot of people in our, in our, you know, our fandoms, uh, they nerds, internalize a lot nerds. of stuff. I mean, we internalize a lot of stuff. I mean, I have a really deep connection. I feel with like Firefly and Dune. I just always say those two because I stare at them when I talk to you guys on the computer. You're a nerd. <laughs> and and like sometimes it's like when you insult them, they insult me sometimes, and you have to remember to take a step back. And we do that a lot. We. And, oh, but I'm not gonna lie to you. Well, I'm not gonna lie to you, Stark Lord. Dune is boring. Uh, Dune is a classic, and it's okay that you find um, it boring, because you've not well, been, like... Uh, you're crying play. over there, I can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the thing that I, I, I want to, um... I want to get your guys' take on this for, real quick. Okay. Um, so there's... Well, now just an anime example, because I've been watching a lot of Robotech recently, okay? Get off my back. <laughs> okay. Um, cool. Robotech is fine. Now, the whole reason I'm using Robotech as an example is there's a lot of people... There's a lot of the... The people who have the weapon he's showing um, with Robotech, because Robotech is only is, how many gold is Robotech? What they did is they took they took three series from Japan that already existed, molded into one kind of continuous story of Robotech. Sort of like the Voltron. Yeah, so you had the Robotech, the Macross saga, you had Robotech, the the uh, the Robotech Master saga, or whatever it is, stuff like that, so on and so forth. Uh, there's like three of them or four, I forget. It doesn't matter. The point and is, I know that there's. there's and there's a lot of people out there who will get angry if you don't call it Macross. Yeah, there's a lot of people who go, you're not watching Robotech, you're watching Macross. And the only thing that they have that's correct is that Harmony of Gold is kind of a dirt and won't let the other story, which really, when you look at them editing-wise, two completely different stories now, they really limited and kind of kept it from the United States to come over. So mm. that is kind of a dirt move. But aside from that, you know, if you're not, if you're watching it, Subtitled, it's pretty, it's pure. If you're watching it dubbed, it's it's terrible. You can't watch dubbed anime; it's terrible. And it's, you know, some people don't like watching the subtitles. Let's be honest. Some people want to watch it and not read. 
and that's fine. And then people forget that, here's an example, G Gundam, great English dubbing, much better than the original oh. pure. Okay, now, I just, there was w one scene that they always do, and I always loved how they did this scene in the anime. But then when I watched the subtitle, I was like, my god, it it sounds like they just b got a bunch of voice actors who are just done with another show, it's 8 o'clock at night, they just want to go home, but they need the paycheck because it's Christmas time, and they just want to get it done. And the subtitle just sounded like so lazily done that it makes the dub look awesome. Yeah, and, it's, and you know, there are just other things that go along with this, and I'm sure uh, other fearless gamers out there can give examples of this, but it's this type of elitism that, A, I think personally, not just in anime, not just in war games, but in comics and video games. And sports. The whole... Yeah, and sports, that but on top of the, yeah. on top of the nerd about stuff. nerdy things, but I don't want to limit it and just it, to nerdy things. It, it exists everywhere. I mean, look at Red Sox and Yankee fans. Sports, oh it God. exists in car companies. It exists in food. It's the it's <coughs> this type of elitism, mm -hmm. but it's in the nerd stuff that makes them like it really makes the whole nerddom, if you want to use that term, look bad. Is the elitism. yeah, and it makes not just like as a whole, but it makes the anime watchers be this well, type of group, and it makes the gamers automatically view it as this type of group. Well, here's a, actually a very good example of that I that I can give is um you um you guys have all watched Dragon Ball Z the original Ocean Dub or Harmony Gold or whenever they were uh, um group. Of course, uh, is I that think the we, one that yeah. aired before Sailor Moon when we were? That kids? was the Funimation one, yes. wasn't it? Yes. No, so no, no, no. Um, there was well before it went to Cartoon Network. Uh, it was on um Channel Eleven um after Sailor Moon, but then it moved to Cartoon Network, and for a small portion. Cartoon Network was um, playing the Ocean Dub because that was the only dub around until Basically, Funimation it's the first, picked it up. It's the first dub. Ocean Dub, yeah, the first Ocean dub, dub was everything up until like basically Goku arrived. Goku on, landing yeah. on Namek. Then yeah, of yeah. course yeah. I've seen that. Okay, well there's one scene in the original where Vegeta fights Goku, and it's when Vegeta creates the fake moon, mm -hmm. and Goku and Vegeta says, you know, your father was a low class fighter like yourself. But he was a brilliant scientist. Who else but him could think of an energy source that perfectly simulates full moon light? And so later on, we all discover that Bardock was not a scientist at all. But they never actually say... They basically, they never disprove that he possibly could have created the idea of the technique of making the fake moon. So I went to... Um, there's a group, um, I believe it's called Kanzen Tai. And I wrote on their Facebook, I was like, hey, you know, I was just wondering what you guys think, you know. Yes, um, it's proven that Bardock isn't really a scientist, but is there any, you know, what about him creating the technique to make the fake moon, since there's really no evidence that proves the contrary to it. And they responded basically going, the proof is the fact that the line doesn't exist. That was done by a dubbing company that didn't understand the source material nor the show that they were dubbing. That, that's, and so, that's telling. and essentially, he ba basically when I saw that, I was like, "Wow, you can really tell these people basically just alienate the ocean dub because, quote unquote, they don't understand the show." Now, I will say this: I'm going to come clean. I'm going to say it. I went out of my way to buy subtitled DBZ before, you know, all the way up, uh, pretty much after, um, after the Freezer Saga, because as. I'm sure you're aware if you watched it back in the day when it was coming out, they didn't really pump out the episodes. They stopped after a while, and it was like a little yeah, low um, So I wanted to see what happened um, next. And so um, I bought the subtitle. But mm -hmm. really, that was because I didn't have access to it on the TV. I wanted to see what happened next. And the reason I bought the subtitle and I liked it is I did like the musical score of the original show better. I will yes. say that. The musical yes. score was done very well, but it wasn't like, it's pure, oh my god. It was... I, I have no other way of seeing what's happening next. This is before we had cool internet sites of those gamers who were young. This is before we had the internet to give us everything we ever wanted now. Um, so I had to go out to a cool store. It was called Shaolin Temple 2. And it had, it was just, it was just anime everywhere. And you just bought it. And it was subtitled and you bought it and it was obviously bootleg. Who cared? And that's how I got, you, you got your fix for the next saga, the next episode that weren't coming out because for one reason or another they just had a halt on it. Um, so, from what I was told, they only had a limited screening time, 
when they dubbed it and their license ended at that episode. Oh, yeah, I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying they did a bad job of that. It's just... Yeah, no, whenever, I'm just saying, like, yeah. that's apparently why they stopped airing past that episode was because their contract ran out, and that was the only episodes they were allowed to air in the U.S. Right. So, if you want to find out what happened next in that time period, that this is going back to when I was really, really watching myself, yeah, they get the stuff Yeah. Done. And those yes, stuff I like titles, I can do. I really like the music that played during that. I mean... Yeah. That's the one thing I will say, if, if there's anything to go, just the DVD, because they haven't really done something that heavily changed, I feel, in animes that I've watched recently, but it's the musical composition of DVD is so different between the dub and the subtitle. Surprisingly, with that, and the way people used to talk a lot, I used to always just assume, okay, every anime from Dragon Ball Z back that came to the U.S. was not the original music that they rewrote it all. Right. Until I watched the show Star Blazers, because I was like, oh, wow, this is a really catchy tune. You know, I kind of like this. I wonder what the original dub, um, the original soundtrack was. And it ended up that they didn't change the theme. They just translated it. And I was very impressed by the fact, by that. And I was like, holy, wow, everything I was perceiving about dubbing companies from the past was apparently wrong. Alright. I got a question for the three of you. And I guess I'll answer it too afterwards. What anime series or movie or I don't want to say video game because that, that brings up more, but what anime movie what anime what anime or movie or even some little T V show series have you felt when it came out was ahead of its time? You know, that look if you when you watch an area you go, Wow, this is really good and I'm surprised it failed back then. Yes, it did. But like you look at it and go, you know what? It may be terrible now, or it may still be good now. This is this came out in the nineties, or this came out in the eighties. This is really ahead of its time when it came out. Um, for me, I would have to say it was Space Battleship Yamato and or Star Blazers, depending on which version that you're more familiar with. Um, because uh, to be honest, with a lot of the old animes, I have trouble watching them because of the animation. I kind of miss um, that about it, though, but I, I know what you're saying. What? I kind of miss what? that old animation style, but I know what you're saying. Yeah. Well, it's like one of those things, like, you know, it just feels very, like, blocky and very, you know, rigid type of thing. You know, it's in, in essence, it's older animation that I'm not uh, really used to. Right. But Star Blazers was one of those shows where I could sit down and I was like, wow, you know, like, I never could expect animation from this time period to be this good. <laughs> And, and so I could see... I know what you're saying. Huh? Um, yeah, I, like, like, it... Go ahead. Yeah, like I said, it's, like, it's just like, you know, the, the action scenes and, like, the way they were moving and such. And I honestly thought that Star Blazers did a better job at action scenes than Gundam, which had a very mm -hmm. similar animation style. Cool. So anyone else? Uh, um, You first, Matt. <laughs> I honestly, when it comes to anime, um, <clears throat> when I watched anime, uh, not just regularly, but really at all, uh, I, I've, I've, I've since widely given up on anime, uh, but when I watched it, it was, I never really watched anything that wasn't, I, you know, I hate to use this word, but, but so basically mainstream, like right. nothing, mm. I, nothing I watched was something that did poorly. At least in 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 the the home market, as it were, you know, nothing that did right. poorly in Japan. You know, some of it didn't end up getting dubbed in the states, but that's you know that that's to the whims of the dubbing companies. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there really isn't anything I can I can look at and be like, you know, oh this this was really good and ahead of its time. I don't know why it didn't do better because I, I didn't really have that broad of an experience with it. Now, what about now? It's not just anime, like live action movies or shows, anything. Um, games, anything you thought that was just like wow. Well, this I, I feel like Andy Kaufman was ahead of his time. <laughs> uh, I think I think he was really funny, but you know nobody got it until like twenty years later. That okay. the funny thing is, like I've only seen one thing of Andy Kaufman's, and I didn't think it was that funny. What did you see? Um, it was pr it was one of the in my opinion one of his dumber gags and it was the wrestling one on SNL. 
Well, that wasn't just the, the, the thing about the wrestling gag is you have to you have to understand it wasn't just the one thing. He did that yeah. for like two years. Yeah, yeah it was I, great. And I like love he, that. he legitimately entered into like the women's world Re- world wrestling federation. Like he I, wasn't I just totally. It, yeah, he wasn't no, just ripping totally, on him. He entered into yeah. like he, it was it wasn't so much. Oh, I'm wrestling women. Isn't that so funny? It's him going to the extent that he did, and you're looking at him, and it's just like, what the? It's it's just absurdist. It's it's not and really it's so abstract. To be, it, <laughs> it's not it, supposed I to under, make sense. It's not so supposed I to be really funny it. either. Like his goal was to be the most vile and horrible villain in wrestling, and it worked. Like, <laughs> and it worked because he was like. He's like, I want to be the bad guy in wrestling because wrestling is like the soap opera of action. It really like, was. It, it it was still is, and he just wanted yeah. to go that extra distance. Like, how can I be the most vile human being possible? Because he, he, he is did more than sort of like our Power Rangers, <laughs> like our Sentai. It's in that, a sense, it's that that sort of like fake action with a really contrived plot that is usually watched mostly by children and. Anti-social adult men. <laughs> but um, I think I think the, the wrestling thing. I think he. Thing. I'm sorry. What'd you say, James? I, I was saying I think he understands that. I think what 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 Matt was trying to say that he gets that it just wasn't into it. Yeah, I mean, he, not not all of his stuff worked. <laughs> you know, I mean that was yeah. that was the one where even I was occasionally sitting there going. Andy, man, you've taken it too far. Uh, <laughs> but I will say my two, the two things that he did that I admire the most were the Tony Clifton thing. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with, with the whole Tony Clifton situation. But uh, I, basically, Tony Clifton was this character that he made up that was just this really vile lounge singer who didn't sing very well, and he was a really just like disgusting, misogynistic, awful human being. But Andy Kaufman refused to admit that he was playing that guy. That he just he, he yep. sold him as another person, <coughs> and it yep. came to the point where people started to catch, you know, started to catch wise to it. So he actually had his manager Bob Zamuda show up to an event as Tony Clifton that he was going to be at. So literally, it was Tony Clifton and Andy Kaufman were in the same room together. So people okay. really were like, "Wait a minute." Apparently his brother also played him a couple of times. Yeah, he got whoever whoever could do it. Um, yeah. Interesting aside, when uh, Jim Carrey was doing Man on the Moon, he was invited. Uh, he was invited to the. Uh, he was invited to um, the Playboy Mansion, but uh, he he uh, said only if he could come as as Tony Clifton. But he got Paul Giamatti who was playing Bob mm-hmm. Zamuda in the movie, to go as Tony Clifton. And then Andy Kaufman shows... Uh, not Andy Kaufman. Jim Carrey shows up to the Playboy mansion. <laughs> he, pulled, he pulled a Tony Clifton. Unfortunately, yeah. Bob Zamuda got beat up and kicked out because nobody got the joke. But mm. uh, I, I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, the second thing that Andy Kaufman did that I really admire is he was actually... Uh, his first appearance on Saturday Night Live was as one of their first musical guests mm-hmm. because yeah. it was fairly early in his career. And he didn't actually... Do anything. He literally just lip sang the to the Mighty Mouse theme. It was good. Yep, it, it was, was genius. <laughs> it was the most genius thing I've seen in my entire life, and nobody got the joke. Like the audience was <laughs> laughing because I, it was that uncomfortable sort of laughter. Both. Yeah, they were the just like, oh, situation. oh, I guess we should laugh. But like at the time, people were like, what is this guy on? <laughs> So I guess I guess if I had to give an answer to James's question, it would have to be Andy Kaufman. <laughs> so so that leaves you, Stark Lord. See, this what is... anime, movie, video game, do you TV show do you feel was ahead of its time? Broke back. Uh, Mountain. Yes, uh, the anime Broke Back Mountain was very before its time, which is why they made the movie ten years later in America. Yeah, I, I got nothing. Um, <laughs> Uh, maybe I don't know. Um, yeah, you just don't like when things become mainstream. It's not even that. It's just I'm like thinking things I like. I'm like, were they before their time? They were always the right time for me. <laughs> well, not for you. Well, we're not, stop thinking about out. you. You're a fringe even person. Were, you're not on. The even if they were successful, like it could be something that was successful, but when it came out, it's like, wow, this is a big leap. And hell, think of Star Wars. That was a big leap of faith ahead of its time type of deal. That's true. Um, it was like the first sci-fi with a classical musical score instead of techno crap. It's not even like 
and it can be successful or a failure. I mean, another good example I'm going to take away from this about that would be the first Tron was way ahead of its time for what it did, even oh, though it yeah. was You're as right. much CG as it was, but it's still something ahead of its time, so it can be mainstream or a failure. So you got to think of something that you enjoy that even if you watch it, like, it was the perfect time for me when it came out. If you know when it came out, then everybody knows when kind of things came out. Mm, it's tough. Uh, I could always go with my standard default, uh, Firefly was before its time, which is why it got killed off, and that was great. Mm. I did. Firefly was awesome. You know, I still haven't um, seen more than just the movie and the pilot episode of Firefly. Uh, I would Even though I own, it in, I own it in its entirety. Oh, so I, I own the whole show. <laughs> like, I've owned the whole show since it was on sale on the Best Buy website a few years ago. I just I haven't know. watched it because I, I guess I just don't care enough. Yeah. But you, you are you enjoyed what you watched though. I think. Yeah, no, I, like I, I, I saw the movie by choice. You no, know, yeah, like, I saw, matters. You don't have to watch it entire. As long as what you saw, you enjoyed. That's all that matters. Yeah, I mean, like I'm, yeah, I, and I, I'll never say it's it's not good. I, I did like it, and I do want to eventually watch it. It's just like for some reason, I'll look at the DVDs and go, I should watch you, and then I don't. You know what was good, <laughs> but no one watched. Um, uh, John Carter. Like no one watched that movie, but it was good. The, I the wanted Disney to. Version? I was broke. Yeah. Uh, the, this is this is a sad thing about the Disney version of John Carter. Uh huh. Oh, was right. Disney went into it going? They already predicted how much money they were going to lose making that film. Yeah. That's so. Not the best tragedy. It looks like <laughs> it's, I'm sitting there going, "Wait a minute!" So you knew the film was going to fail. Yet you made it anyway. Because they don't make their money on the initial release. They make their money on the DVDs and merchandising. Also, most yes, uh, most um, of their money doesn't come Star from Lord. live action. Yeah. Yes, Stark Lord. You think I don't know that going to school for film? I know. I'm just I saying know. that's what they do. They're like, we'll no, make it. All I understand that, but still, they sat there and they no, they they literally said they basically predicted with DVD sales and everything that they were not going to make back what they spent on the film, then and they still went keep, along and made. They it. Well, they signed the a contract. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is, is it's um, possible that the the the, loss, the potential lawsuits that would have come from breaking whatever contract they signed would have been more costly than making the film. Yeah. That might have been it. the question I have, real quick. Now, you may not know this because we don't know the exact contract, but if maybe they did a little bit better marketing or calling it something a little bit different, if people want John Carter, no idea what that is, Nick. Yeah, the, you know? the, problem, well, the problem they had well, is, hold on, the actual name of the first novel is uh, A Princess of Mars, and they were afraid that that one would confuse people. I'm like, I don't want to watch a movie about a princess because they don't realize it's an action movie. And they couldn't figure out what to call it. They should have just called it the Mars Chronicles or something and called it, you know, John Carter Chronicles, Princess of Mars. Just call it the first one. See, the, whole name. Well, the problem I, I have with that other... explanation, Stark Lord, is... Uh, it's dumb. Dis- no, it's Disney. Yeah. Disney calls something a princess movie, they're going to make money. Yeah, but they, they, yeah. they wanted the right... Right demographic to go to, well, and that's not the another issue. That another was issue mistake. was is they they also said based off the hit novel, and then anyone who decided to do a Google page found out that the novel was trash. I don't think so. I read that I novel. I don't know if it's it was necessarily bad. trash. So, it was just from, old. From, it's from from, you know, from what I've been hearing. From what I've been hearing, and from everything that I've heard, the book did not do well. Well, well, the thing is, it didn't do well when. When it when was it released came out. in the in like when, the 30s, uh, you mean from, it was released in 1911, Matt? If, from what even, I've been told, oh, even, even a lot so. of if, from what I've been told, a lot of the you know when I was like, oh the John Car- oh I, they're making a movie based off John Carter, everyone was like, yeah that book wasn't very popular, nor was it very good. Uh, well, thing, I doubt cool. most also, of the people you've spoken to even knew what they were talking about. In fact, I'm hold on, uh, I'm going to go quiet for a second. I'm googling. Uh, well, really quick, it was released originally as a newspaper serial, so it was a popular serial, serial so they were releasing it like once a week, a chapter kind of thing. And then afterwards, since it was popular, they made it into a book. Here's the problem with that. Short of the Bible, you can't say based on this hit book that came out over a century ago. You know what I mean? Yeah, pretty much. Also, the first book came out in 1917. The serials were started in 1911, I'm almost positive of that. I, I, I bet I bet it was. I'm looking at the publication history now. Hold on. Okay. Uh, um, 1912. Uh, I was off by a year. My bad. Yeah, it counts. <laughs> you can't. No. Say, like, you can't say based on something that's so old that wasn't 
like if that wasn't ground shaking, breaking, changing the industry standard. Like short of the Bible, you can't say something that's really old and go based on this, and people go, "Oh, okay." Uh, also, you always say it's based on a hit novel, even if it's not a hit. I mean, that's just yeah, smart. but that's the problem. Uh, it's when yeah. you don't have the hit. Oh. Speaking of that, um, I have a great um, thing. First, I have one question um, bef- um, after I s- make this little funny story, because um, it's based off a movie, based off a book. Um, me, the Wild Card, and Elena went to see The Hobbit. Mm-hmm. And while we were seeing The Hobbit, we saw a little trailer for a movie called The Host. Yes. Now, for those who are not aware, The Host was a book written by Stephanie Meyer. And from what I heard, it was really horribly bad. It's, in fact, it, from what I've heard, it's so bad, Stephanie Meyer hasn't written a book since. And there's a couple of people I know who are big book fanatics. They love the Twilight series. They openly admitted it was the first book they ever returned because they just couldn't stand it. And so me and James are talking about, you know, quietly whispering, you know, to each other about the thing. And this guy about so oh, he was like what 40 late 40s early oh, 50s had to be at least in the 50s and he okay. sits there and goes guys you gotta be quiet trying to listen and i was like you really want to hear about a trailer based off a book written by the person who gave us twilight he doesn't Are you maybe really maybe he doesn't interested? know that maybe he's interested in well it. no because as soon as um he said his comment a good <laughs> tw- 20 seconds after it said based off the um from the author who brought us twilight maybe he wanted it wasn't, it. It some, some people was. just get picky being, about people talking in theaters that's true we were really even loud and it wasn't even like it was just all around it wasn't just us but all around us people were going oh let me see that movie oh like, like you know oblivion looks cool like it wasn't like you were going yeah get some yeah it was it, 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 was, it was just I, funny because I think he was there against his will, and he was scoffing down literally a tub of popcorn without any drink, like torturing himself. <laughs> um, well, on a quick note, the general concept of the host doesn't sound bad. Maybe they'll do a good job with the movie. I mean, the book is well, bad, they can really make good. a good movie out of it. Well, from what I've been told, at least, and I can agree to this to some degrees, that Stephanie Meyer can't write a book, but she can write a okay, decent film. Well, you see, really I write still the film disagree or when you, I still disagree when you say that because you haven't shown me that she's written any screenplays. Like, yeah, she comes up with with potentially good concepts, but that's not writing a film. That's coming up with a concept. Show me that she's written a good screenplay, and I'll agree with you when you say that. I believe I can, she. I'll actually, accept the I'll accept the good film comments because it's you know just for for you know for showing that she can write to something that became something that. You know, took over like a decent portion of people watching it. Whether or not it was an actual screenplay and her legitimately writing a film, which it's on film and not someone written and acted out by people. But um, the, the thing with the host, though, it looked like a great trailer until I saw Stephanie Meyer's name pop up. <laughs> <laughs> and now, the like, general now, concept of the, the movie or the book, if I'm going to ruin it for you guys, whatever. Uh, everyone in the world is basically taken over by this parasitic aliens, and they make everyone nice and happy. But this one girl, uh, of course, because it's a Stephanie Meyer book, so it's one special girl, uh, you know. Yep. Has and one control- special boy. Has some control over it, and she likes this guy, and she wants to, like, you know... Run away with him away so with they can him. live parasites so free. It's, yeah. So it's the giver. Yep. Uh, well, the giver doesn't have parasites, but it's, it's another okay, twist it's, it's, on, on uh, what's it called? You know, the body snatchers. Yep, it's another invasion of the body snatcher. It's, it's the giver. It's it's John, it's John Carpenter's. They live. It's body snatchers. Like it's it's, um, a, it's an inherent good concept to base of Felmar, and then you see Seth yeah. Meyers' name pop up, and you go, "Oh God, it's gonna glitter." <laughs> it, it might glitter. That's no. true. And I I, no. I don't like glittering vampires. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think any of us here do, but That's we do know, fun. Stark Lord, that your girlfriend does ha- does um, make a heated argument when someone brings up the vampires don't sparkle. Uh, she 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 uh, you know it's like uh, what it is 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 the books when it, she she'll defend the books exce- a, a bit because yeah. uh, she like, does make one interesting point about the whole vampire sparkle thing, but it's not enough to make me accept I mean, I don't like it, but it's like, hey, someone tried something different, good for you. And she'll defend the books on the level that it's written for a certain demographic, 
And honestly, hi, I'm a male. I'm not a female between the ages of 18 and 40. I'm not in the demographic, so I'm not probably going to like it. It's written yeah, for a very specific that's, that's, audience, and it's, you know, she was trying something different. And that's fine, and I accept that. Whatever, you like what you like, I like what I like. That still doesn't... It's my big problem is, is that you could easily made up something. Like, when you take a mythos, any mythos, you can take any mythos right now, and we basically write, overwrite what it is, we, we, I feel we can't as... as we can't na- name it the same mythos. Um... <laughs> Well, or good, or the one thing is, is like you know when changing stuff around like that. Like there's another book series called The Night World, where they do kind of change the concept of what a vampire can and can't do and all that stuff. But it's explained in one book to a point where you're like, okay, now it starts making sense. Where it's not, it may not be what we perceive it to be, but it's where the legend came from, and over time the legend just got evolved to what we standardly believe it as. Yeah. So I can understand that, and that's probably the only point that I can under, that I can, I can't argue with with the whole vampire sparkling is the fact that it would be worse if everyone was like, well, yeah, everybody knows that. Yeah. If it wasn't more like, holy crap, they don't burn in the sun. That's the only thing that can be argued about it. The thing is, in my is that the vampire mythos, though old and classic and in multiple cultures, is changed over time. Uh, I it mean, has, we look at classic. the stuff that we like. We like, uh, I think all of us like Vampire the Masquerade, at least the first Masquerade. Yes. I like Requiem also, but that's not for everyone. But that's all very Anne Rice-ian, and before, and we like Anne Rice vi- vampires, personally. <laughs> but before that, I mean, Dracula and Anne Rice vampires are similar, but they're different. Like, she took a different path with it, and we were cool with it. It's just, mm-hmm. uh, what's her name? Stephanie Meyer took a path with it that we think is kind of silly, so uh, whatever. But she that, tried something I, I, had, I had to do a whole research paper on, on the mythology of vampires and, and uh, like anthropy, and... Even when you get down to the base core, through the different cultures to have it, to, you know, evolve differently on, but yet on a similar path of what vampirism is, it's still stuff like it's not just Stephanie Meyer, but anybody who really takes the mythos to a degree where it really lost, except for the whole immortality thing and never aging, but really lost like its core fundamentals. No matter what it is, vampire, werewolf, angel, demon, pixie. Uh, I don't know, giant college, whatever it is, right? You know, you have to change, you have to call something different. You have you exactly. can't like the, the mythos has to be different. It's a different mythos. It's no longer a vampire. It's an immortal. Sure, call it something. Exactly. Different. It's like describing a pig and calling it a walrus. It is true. Yeah, it's true. It's I like can, if we I call the immortals that. some Highlander vampires. Exactly. Yeah, they're, exactly. they're not. They're not vampires. Oh, thank you. Like James. that's. That like that's at, the, at that point up because I was having trouble like putting it to words because mm, I, that's, I, that's I, 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 it. I will admit uh, I, I am super butthurt over this whole Twilight thing being uh, a thing that exists on this planet. <laughs> like, yeah, I get so I mean, like oh, I get I I, I get incoherent it, over it sometimes. Yeah. I just don't like it because it's so I feel degrading to its target audience. Well, there are a couple of things in it where I think are kind of are insulting to the demographic that's going to. And a lot of it, this is a funny thing, okay, is is apparently it's like one of the things about it was is it was it was written as a alternative, a alternative to Harry Potter, which she believed is blatantly evil. Well, it's like so unwed teenage sex. So unwedded teenage sex with necrophilia and bestiality is okay. Well, if you um, notice, did, no, they, didn't have, they didn't have sex until they were married, right? Yeah. No, they, get, they did not have sex until they, they were married. married. They have sex. They have sex once. It is brutal. It's painful. She never has sex again. She has a child once, and that's it. It's uh, for the well, most part, it's a very much an allegory for abstinence of the books. What you tell me is that they're were, they're were cats. No, it's 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 just the, the it's the Mormon approach to sex. It, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, of it's course. not supposed to be pleasant for the woman. You know, women are women are, are are not meant to enjoy it. They're just there to deliver babies, and they shouldn't talk. That's the Mormon approach to women, and that's how she wrote the books. And right, like, like I said, I get incoherent over these books. Like if you look at 
the generation, we'll say the, the Twilight generation real quick, right? Of like readers and people who read that and, and whether they're shaped by it or not or sculpted a bit by it or not. And let me look back when we were in not in that demographic because we're not girls, but of that age range, people know the age range, and look what was around for us, for them. Completely different. And I think a much more wholesome thing than what Twilight is. Mm. Personally. Like, what, what, but, I mean, I, for Shira? <laughs> Shira. Like, why can't Shira, we just give our give give women Shira and, and things Shira like that? Shira was not a bad role model. She was a great role model. Yep. Have you guys ever <laughs> seen Secret of the Sword? Uh, probably. <laughs> it's been a long time. It's technically the first two episodes of Shira. Then yeah, I've seen it, but I don't remember it. And what it was is, is they did um to introduce Shira, they um they took the first two episodes, they comboed them together, they called it the Secret of the Sword, and that was their theatrical release. <laughs> for He-Man, and then She-Ra started, which was interesting. With that was Hordak, and that whole crew Mm -hmm. was supposed to be a He-Man villain, but the toy lineup came out before the show was up, but they were building up She-Ra and everything. And one of Hordak's um, cohorts was a female wizard, very much like the sorceress. And um, everyone just went, oh, that must be Shiva's rival, that must be Shiva's rival, and everything. And basically they went, well, everyone's already assuming they're Shira villains, so we kind of have to now? <laughs> Can I just say, I find it fascinating that Shira is one of the few uh, fantasy female characters uh, that wears more than her male counterpart. It is true. Like he man, yeah. he man's running around next to naked, but she's actually. She, I mean, she's wearing a tube dress, but she's wearing a dress. Like yes, for it's those true. who have never who've never watched, he man usually is wearing a tight speedo and he's in his leather own, strap. Uh, he's it's in his a own. furry speedo. <laughs> it's a furry. And it is fuzzy. Speedo. Yeah, it's a fuzzy one. And he's got these two like straps going across his chest. And Shira's got the skirt, the boots, the dress chest, on. like the Xena armor. To a point, yeah. and she's got the cape and the dress. Like she's actually wearing clothing. She's wearing more than Wonder Woman wears. That is true. You know, and she's, and got, she's got a big Wonder sword. Woman. And what'd you say? And Wonder, and Wonder, Wonder Woman wears more than So she's wearing it's more. True. Than, so yeah. she is wearing more than the person who's wearing more than He Man. He Man. <laughs> right. Like that. That that so rarely happens, especially yeah. in fantasy. And it's just like. Oh yeah. You know, we went from Shira being like the the media attempt at giving girls a positive role model to that's not my little pony to 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 Twilight being the 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 the, positive the, the, role the model. quote unquote positive role model or right. like Fifty Shades being the the, the guy right, let's, like let's can not. we can right. we please just go back and reevaluate how, where the heck Everything went totally clown shoes. Well, between we then and now, thing. but we we in side note, we at least have the better role model in in uh, My Little Pony. Friendship is magic. That's actually a decent role model. And you know, I'll, I'll give you that. But I feel like female humans need need something human shaped as well. That's true. They, they need, need like, a yeah, model. I can like I can like yeah. Like, have you ever really noticed like as um. Um, Matt just brought up a lot of guys like the more kids shows now that are gunned towards guys get the more human based characters and the more girl based yeah, shows more animals, tend to get the because girls more like animals, cute animals but that doesn't necessarily translate to role models yeah mm-hmm. because you know we, we model think... ourselves off of the things that we look like that's just that's that's biology yeah, yeah. Um, I but seriously, I mean, we, we have a black president is, now. Can we have yeah. a halfway decent female role model? In, Which in is media? also interesting if you notice a lot of times the villains and female um, shows that are based off animals are people. <laughs> yeah. Um, like in the original My Little Pony, the villain was a person. It was a witch and her two daughters. Yeah. yeah. True. It's you know, they tend to make humans the bad guy in girl shows. Which, isn't, which is kind of weird. We just got to go back to Lady Jane throwing a spear and taking on a Cobra Jet with her spear. Yo, Lady oh, yes. Jane was awesome. Just say. Lady yeah. Jane, even Scarlet. And Jinx. Don't forget Jinx. Yeah, but I just think Lady Jane with her spear and Baroness, I'll even take the, the Baroness. laser fire is a much better role model. Because she took on a jet with that spear. <laughs> yep. Now, now, speaking of, I just have a random question here. No. Um... I I just recently just watched a movie on Netflix. Um, Matt, you'll probably enjoy this. I watched um, Grave Encounters. Oh, I love that movie. Um, the sequel was garbage, but I love that movie. Now, 
stop me if I'm wrong, but didn't that film have trailers on TV? Because I swear it's possible. to high he- to high heaven that I saw the the scene where the girl's hair flies up. I swear I saw that in a movie trailer for a film. It's possible on TV. I mean, uh, you know, didn't didn't it go to Tribeca? It's entirely possible there were there yeah. was there were it, well, TV it was spots. made by Tribeca. Okay, yeah, it's entirely possible. It was there in were a, TV spots. It was made by Tribeca and the American Express Company. Yeah, it's entirely possible there were TV spots. I don't know. I I never saw any. But yeah. it's super but possible. I'm, I'm ninety percent sure because that one. Because as soon as that scene happened, I was like, "Wait a minute! I swore I saw a commercial for this in college." Yeah, I mean, and it was it was um, in college. It it. I don't think it's that old. Let me, oh, let me look find it up. Yeah. out. Grave. Okay. Grave Encounters is a two thousand and eleven film. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, it's not so that old. apparently not. <laughs> then I must have seen a, then I must have seen a spot for another film that had a, that similar, had a image. similar scene. Yeah, well, a lot of horror movies have that similar sort yeah. of image in it. But um, surprisingly, I kind of like that film. It kind of reminded me of what a good Silent Hill game nowadays could be. Yeah, it was it was halfway decent. I mean, especially considering most of the horror movies we get nowadays are garbage. Some of the effects were a little cheesy, but even well, then it know. was still really good. Yeah. Like it was very good setup. I liked the the amount of the amount of horror in it. There were a couple of predictable moments, but there were still a bunch of shots where I was like, "Whoa, I did not see that coming." Yeah, uh, don't bother watching the sequel. It wasn't very good. Yeah, I, I kind of uh, looked at it from the cover. Uh, the Vince brought up a kind of a, a point, like, I think on times when this and the sentence structure. You know, pl- you know, parts that, you know, were kind of predictable. I wanted to get people, to, you guys' opinion on this, and you feel as gamers as well. Uh, I don't mind a little bit of predictability in movies. If, you know, if I'm enjoying the movie and it's going well, if I, even if I can predict how it's going to end or whatever, for me, if it's a film that's done well, that doesn't bother me. How do you guys feel? Um, I think it depends <coughs> on how the movie's marketed, primarily. Yeah. And then comedy. it also depends on genre. Um, for example, comedy, uh, if it's predictable, tends to fall flat. Yeah. Because part well, of yeah. comedy is is giving you those punchlines that maybe you see you some of them coming, them. but. Part of part well, of I don't mean is necessarily surprise. that. I mean like the plot, like oh, okay, you know, she's gonna okay. Get the girl, um, but... I think when it comes to plot, it's it's still again a genre thing. Uh, right. For example, you, you know, part of the reason you don't hear a lot about like romantic comedies as much as you did 15 years ago is because they all had the exact same plot and people got sick of it. Uh, whereas yeah. the horror genre, the plots can be kind of the same because. It just it can it can work that way. The action it's genre horror. you can you know that like that the whole joke on the action genre was the Expendables. You know, like the action genre is all about recycling plots because it's not. Oh, about I agree. Plots. I agree, you know? and it's not that I don't want some. I, I like the fresh. The wow, I need that coming moment. But I mean, I everyone feel, likes a little fresh. But but I also feel at the same time. There was a point in movies that try too hard for that. You kind of go, okay. Oh, absolutely. So what, you're ab- you're absolutely right. In a right. movie, what's the plot that's going to be this time? And I don't mind having a straightforward plot. Oh yeah, you're movies, abs- you're you know? absolutely right. Sometimes a predictable, straightforward <laughs> plot is a little bit better than someone trying to surprise you over and over again. I just think it's better suited when they admit it, and when it's in a yeah. genre that that works that way. Because not like, every genre works that way. You do have to be a little more creative with some of them. Right. Like a good example I find is is like there are a couple of films out there where um like where you sit there and go okay and this is the point where this happens but then there's some films where you're like okay and you're like ah oh, you know I totally called that but still it was amazing um a good example um that I can throw out there is Josh um Josh Whedon when it's Josh, we all, Josh Whedon there's no Josh. H. That, Sorry. Forgive me. A, uh, Joss is short for Joshua or something, isn't it? Yeah, but he he always puts two. I know S's, it's Joss. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when when we when we go to see a film of his with us, we usually go, "Okay, guys, which character is going to die?" And even <laughs> though his uh, even look, though look, we look, wait, 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 no, no, I gotta finish this. But even though we are expecting him to kill off someone. It still is a moving moment when it happens. Yeah. 
even though we're already going, okay, guys, bets on who it is. Right. It's, it's uh, the difference uh, between... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, on that note, when uh, this was, what, two or three years ago when he was at Comic-Con, uh, mm -hmm. he spent all night, practically all night, waiting to get signatures for him. You know, it was like 4 a.m. in the morning. We got to the thing, and our friend Stan, when he got up to him, it was right before Dollhouse came out, so whenever a year Dollhouse came out, it was Joss and the main character from that, not Eliza Jushku, the guy. Uh, and my friend Stan went up to him and said, I look forward to your no show, and I look forward to you killing my favorite character. And Joss just laughed at him, because he gets it a lot. And it's just yeah. true. He always kills the character you love most, but that's... Well, not always, but it's it's part of his writing style, is that he likes to make you feel about every character. So honestly, uh, someone's... Well, that's the him. thing, though, oh. is, is even though we're pr basically aware he's going to do mm -hmm. it, it's still done in a way where it still moves yeah, us. Yeah, it's never just someone getting just off. It's like, oh, they're dead now off screen. It's like, it's moving, it's meaningful, it's not pointless. And even though you're sitting there the whole time going, no, don't, don't, not him, not him, not him, not her, not her. Right, it's it's the difference exactly. between... Go ahead. Hmm? Go ahead, James. Uh, well, with, that, with that being said, um, I agree with, with that, you know, with, with humanity and, you know, having Avengers and other movies, and other stuff, other stuff. Um, at the same time, I also do appreciate a character that's built up and then just off. Like, uh, two examples. The Walking Dead series, whether you watch it or not, I'm not going to give anything away, but the characters just bite it. And it fits with the scene. It's very bleak. It's a very bleak type of setting, obviously. So it fits well. And another one that did it very well, and I'm upset it didn't go past the second season, was, was the Sarah Connor Chronicles. Because you literally have this one character built up for basically two full seasons, and he's just off in the most unceremoniously, most anticlimactic, but very fitting way. It makes you kind of go, wait, did that just happen? <laughs> kind of like, it's not like, you don't, it's not like the whole build up where it's not even moving. It's just kind of like, Whoa, that just got real. And so I like both I think both work very well depending on how you do it. But with Josh he does a very good job of making you go, This is gonna hurt even though I know who he's doing it to but then you have well you know, I think when a show or a movie can just off a dude that you really like like that was there for like you expect him to survive or whatever, just off when you kinda of go, Whoa, this just got yeah. real I think it's, I also enjoy that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 essentially the difference between watching and again I'm going to use romantic comedy as an example of something where it, it falls flat to use the same plot over and over again, but watching like romantic comedy number fifteen, where you know that the guy is gonna you know have a commitment issue and run away and then realize what he's given up and come back to the girl in the end and everybody lives happily ever after. And that moment where, in a horror movie, when someone is going down into the dark basement alone, despite how dumb it is, and you still have that tense feeling going, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, yeah. don't do it. Because, you you know, you don't know if she's gonna if she's going to turn the light on and get killed, or there's not going to be anything down there, and then she's going to get back upstairs and get killed. Like, you know, it's just, oh, yeah. you, you just you, you put yourself in that situation, and you're just like, I don't want to do it. But it's another just, very classic overly done um, plot that can get boring after a while is the liar reveal plot. Because yeah. they have the exact same formula. Dude makes lie. Dude is, dude is found out. Dude, everyone hates him. He redeems himself. Everybody's happy. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a really yeah. standard simple plot. It, it can work occasionally, but it's used It depends on how it's done. It's all in the details. Yeah, yeah, what? Uh -oh. It's all in the details. That, yeah. Oh, yeah. I had no idea what you said. I was like, what? Yeah. Uh, I, what you talking about the hard thing? <coughs> I just I, I just love, you can tell a horror movie, even if you're just walking into it and it's muted. Or even if it's like playing like low volume, you're not getting a really eerie feeling. Going, okay, it's dark out, a group of people in some abandoned house, or there's a house that lost power, let's instantly split up. Then you can tell it's a horror movie. Right, right. Because <laughs> any cover more movie ground or if we drama, split up. they stay together. But when it's a horror, it's like, okay, anyone can get killed at any moment. Bobby, take the steps. I'll go into the basement. You go into the backyard. You stay right here. Don't report yes. back unless you die. It's like, like, oh, 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 Stark Lord's gone missing. Guys, if we split up, we'll find him faster. Yep. <laughs> like, yep. No, no, don't do that. Okay, okay, that's it. We have to make a horror film where that I'll happens. I'll be right back. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, actually, exactly. Though, I will be right back. <laughs> and also there's the whole um, don't sleep with anybody because only the virgin survives. Yeah. And also it's a classic well, 
Guys, let you go. I'm going to go take a shower now. <laughs> yeah. Wait, but we are in an abandoned creepy house. Maybe you shouldn't be naked. <laughs> oh, and I think the favorite, I think one of my favorite horror cliches is, is there's a, you're, you walk, okay, you look, you look, you go, you see someone at the back door. There's no one at the front door, so you go upstairs. <laughs> well, you don't want to go you know outside with the them. Back, well, no, they're at, like, they're in the back of the house. Like, they're in the house, you're on the same level, and there's nothing stopping you from getting out of the house. You immediately run up the stairs and into, like, a closet. Well, I mean, if they're faster than you are, and you leave the house, they might be able to chase you through wherever area you are and catch you. Whereas if you get upstairs, you might be able to hide. Yeah. Sometimes, when you're scared, you make the wrong move. Let's leave it at that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, panic does some awful things. Panic's a hell of a drug. Yeah. Yeah, Uh, But but look at other things. Oh, sorry. The panic, the panic response issues two things: fight or flight. I have yet to see a horror movie that they do it, but I have yet to see a horror movie go, "Okay, I'm panicked. Let me fight it and actually kind of not die." Because every time they take the fight response, they get skewered. But well, yeah, because response, it's a horror movie. No, but it would be cool if like you expect him to die, but for some reason he just does the unexpected, grabs a heavy lamppost, <laughs> swings it, and gets the guy to go away. And he turns out to be the only survivor. The guy thought was going to bite him right then and there because he actually had the proper response at the proper moment. The, the horror villain guy didn't expect it, fought him off enough, and it's like, whoa, what just happened? I um, I want to I wanna say that's happened a couple of times in some movies, not necessarily to the, to the letter, but... Um, like, uh, in, in the first Halloween film, yeah, uh, she was hiding and running for the majority of the film, but the last moment she was cornered, she did decide to fight back, and that's what saved her. Right. Um, I don't and know if I've thing. seen... Be a very cl- I don't know if I've very- seen somebody clock, you know, the slasher or the monster or, or whatever quite like that. Um, That'd be great. It tends so, to be a yeah, very common be. thing I tend to find, is, is that it's a flight... Um, response until the end when they bring them to a situation where they have to fight. Right. Um, yeah, it, it you know, I, feel, I feel like I've seen at least one horror movie where like the jock character is like I got this and like tries to 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 fight it and actually holds his own for like 40 seconds which <laughs> is more than usual. But yeah. I, I really can't remember a specific example. So well, I, I, you I'm know, sure I it's out there because Let's face it, we can, we can say, for a particular genre, a particular plot point, and it's happened in at least one movie, if not four. Actually, you know what? You know what movie actually did something like that? And I hate to say it, Jennifer's Body. <laughs> um, the, the main character really didn't do much running specifically from, uh, from Jennifer, the Megan Fox character. Uh, mm. there was, there was some, some avoiding, because, like, it didn't all go down until, like, the last act. But once it yeah. all went down and she found out exactly what was going on, like, she showed up and just started wailing on her with a pipe. Yeah. <laughs> like, like Amanda Seyfried was just wailing on Megan Fox with a pipe and, like, impaled her. And then, like, later on, like, cut her open with, like, a box cutter. So, that's that. I think that uh, <laughs> is, is the closest equivalent, I guess, that I've seen in horror films. Yeah. And unfortunately, it was in one of the worst horror films ever made. <laughs> like I would rather watch Ginger Snaps again than watch Jennifer's Body. Ooh. What about Sleepaway Summer Camp or whatever that horrible one was? You know, it's not. It can't possibly be as bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but other genres, uh, it can be good. Like um, you go into drama and you think about uh, the classic. You know, uh, uh, God, what's it called? The like the sa- the noble savage thing. Yeah. And you think Dances yeah. with Wolves, uh, The Last Samurai, and Avatar? Tarzan? Uh, not even Tarzan. We'll get into that. That's a whole other version of the Noble Savage. But yeah, I mean, we've seen Tarzan a billion times. We've seen Dances with Wolves is the same movie as The Last Samurai and Avatar. They're all the same movie. And I like right. all three of them. Um, it I works, think, of course. Yeah. And the thing is, those those movies are actually slightly less common than That's than true. the ones I talk about, the ones I I'm specifically thinking of that have fallen flat and become tired. You know, like yeah, we've gotten those examples you made, but as far as mainstream films, we haven't really gotten much more than what you mentioned. 
for that yeah, specific we haven't done story. Seventeen dances with wolves. Right, right. I think once we oh, get God. seventeen dances with wolves in the mainstream film industry, then it might start to become tired, and you might have to get worried. Fair enough. But yeah. um, I, 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 I do see what you're where you're coming from. And there are some stories that are like that that can still be done, even though they've done been done before, and maybe have more of a lifespan, more of a shelf life, because they're not done as often. Yeah. yeah. What you know? What? Here's some homework for maybe if you have gamers out there, one one of the fearless the movie I saw, Wicker Park. I what's it called? Wicker Park. Wicker Park. Okay. B i c k e r Park. Uh, it's some type of drama thing, whatever. It's a t- it's completely a film that I would have never have pictured myself watching ever, but I watched it. It was actually pretty interesting. Um, if any if anybody has seen it, comment saying that you have seen it. Uh, you don't know, even like the noble savage type of syndrome. I don't know what syndrome is in with the park, but it was interesting. So if anybody wants to do some some legwork and, and watch a movie and, and let me know, that'd be great because I can't figure. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, how long have we been doing this? About yeah. an hour. A little so over an hour. We can probably um, it looks like kill this off. Yeah, may as well. So that is all for right now. Um, thank you all for listening to this podcast. Yeah. Um, to be perfectly honest, I never thought we would talk so much about Twilight as we did. Um, in this one. Yeah. So, Way to go on that one. I blame yeah. you. All your fault. <laughs> You always have to bring yeah, what's Twilight wrong with up. You? Possibly. It's now, because you like so, Twilight and you want us to, too. I get it. I get it. Why do it? We did it so the Felix gamers don't have to. Yes. 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 So, that is all for right now. Again, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions that you want to ask us, feel free. And until next time, Fearless Gamers, this is Matt the Vet. Matt the Clown. And the Wildcard. There you and, go. And the Dark Lord. Take care. Bye-bye now.